Religiously, we can say, no, Jannah is success. Dunya is not success. We know that. <laughs> I'm not talking about what you say. I'm talking about what goes on in your head. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى we're starting our second session on Surah Al-Asr the first one was on Sunday and that was part mostly the overview and a broader look at the contents of this profound surah that most if not all of us have memorized. It is made up of three ayat. It's one of the shortest surahs in the Qur'an and something very, very commonly repeated and known. Inshallah ta'ala, today we're going to complete the overview and then move on to the word-by-word analysis and some commentary from great ulama of our history that have pondered upon this surah and written some great things in their tafsir in regards to it. The first thing we're going to talk about today is the fact that this is one of the surahs that belongs to a score of surahs that begin with oaths, a qasam. Allah Azza wa Jal takes an oath in many, many, many surahs. And in this series, we have talked about this before. The benefit of, the, of Allah taking an oath, how it's, what rhetorical purpose does it have? What's the purpose of Allah swearing? You know, the, the rough translation, if I was to say, wal asr, I swear by time. It's a very coarse translation, but still, the point that's coming across is Allah Himself is taking an oath, He's swearing by something. What's the benefit of Allah Azza wa swearing? There are a few. One of them is to acknowledge the grandeur, the magnificent nature of something. Whatever Allah swears by is something profound and magnificent. This is one opinion held by Mufassirun. This is certainly the case here or part of the case here. Why? Because in many hadith, for example, لا تسب الدهر فإن الله هو الدهر very famous hadith and other types, this type of hadith, they're found in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. They're very, very common. Don't curse time because Allah Himself is ad dahr He is time. Allah describes Himself as the timeless, right? So don't curse time. So it's actually, it has to do with you know, divine attribution, time itself. So we're not supposed to say things like, oh man, that was a bad day, right? Or this was a terrible year. You know how they use these adjectives for time? The, the very explicit words of the Messenger والسلام, forbidding us from doing that. So one way this has been understood is Al Asr Hu Ad Dahar. Allah swore by time, Asr, and the almost synonymous term to that is Dahar, which also occurs in the Quran. So it's something that is magnificent, that's something that is profound, something that demands reflection. In other words, Allah is calling the human being's attention to reflect on the passage of time. That's one meaning. The second is that the, you know, we talked about the object of the oath and the subject of the oath, the muqsam bihi and muqsam alayhi, the Arabic terminology. What I mean by that, I'll repeat it very, very briefly. If I say to you, I swear by Allah, I didn't do that. I said this long sentence, I swear by Allah, I didn't do that. The object of my oath is the word Allah. And the subject is what? I didn't do that. Right? So there's the object and the subject. In this surah, there's also the object of the oath, wal asr. What's the object? Al asr. What's the subject? Inna al insana lafi khus. Allah says he swears by time or by the passage of time, and then he declares that all human beings are immersed in a state of loss. So there's the object being time and the subject being the loss of the human being. When this happens, typically in the Quran and also in ancient Arabic rhetoric, the object is actually a proof of the subject. That's one of the ways it's understood. That the object is a proof of the subject. It's a dalil for the subject. In other words, if you say human beings are in loss, and somebody says, what's your proof? Well, in this surah, what's the number one proof that human beings are in loss? That the human beings are immersed in bankruptcy? Time itself is proof. What is the one thing human beings are losing all the time? Time. <laughs> right? Where this is an asset we can never keep. We can never hold on to this hour, this minute, this second. It is leaving us and it will continue to leave us. It is not something you can store and use later on. 
It is something that, and by the way, we have lost a lot of time already. There, you know, you look back in your life and you say, there are so many opportunities I could have taken advantage of and I didn't. I could have used my time better, but I didn't. I had this opportunity and that opportunity, but I didn't make the most of my time. So there's this regret about time that has already passed away. And you should use that regret to transform the way you're going to use your time in the future. But essentially, Allah has tied two things together. The idea of thinking about human loss, and associated with the, He associated that with the passage of time. So one is the proof of the other. Another way it's, Al-Asr is understood is, it's not just, and we'll see this later on, in, as is commented in Ash-Shafi, is that uh, Asr is also, it refers to the, the life of nations. The zaman, the, the duration of the life of an entire nation. You know how entire nations rise and then they fall? Right? So when Allah uses the word Asr, it doesn't just refer to the passage of a time of a day, only, or the life of one person, but the life of an entire nation. And these rises and falls of nations themselves are proof that human beings are in loss. History itself becomes a proof that human beings are in loss. And that's captured by Allah saying, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ then you go further and we find that the, this is the second and very important concept in as far as the relationship between muqsam bihi and muqsam alayhi is that the oath that the object of the oath is a is a witness for the subject of the oath this is different now we said two things the object is a proof of the subject that's one thing the second is the object is a witness for the subject in other words allah calls a witness against the subject in other words, how we understand that now in Surah Al-Asr is Allah is bringing time as a witness to something. What's the, what, is, what is time supposed to witness? That no doubt human beings are immersed in loss. What does that mean? That means many, many, many human beings. And as we study the, the exact commentary of the Mufassirun, this will become more clear. But to make it very brief and simple right now, for now at least, is the following. You and I, we, you know, and humanity at large, they run after things. We run after things that, that are actually distractions from our real purpose in life. That should remind you of a surah we studied, the one before this. Al-Hakum at takathur It deluded you. The, the want of more. The mutually shared urge to get more and more. It, it distracted you from your real purpose. Most humanity is distracted running after the wrong thing. They're running after the wrong thing. Now, are we the first people to run after wealth? or to run after a house, or to run after getting married to a beautiful woman, or this or that, whatever it may be. Are we the first to run after these things, or were there people before that ran after these things too? They were. And people ran after them thinking that they are going to have success. When they get them, they will have success. And time, Allah made time a witness that people came, and they ran after these things, and they failed. And then other people came, and they ran after these things, and they failed again. And other people came and did the same thing again. Thousands upon thousands of years, hundreds upon hundreds of generations, one after another, the same drama over and over again. And one creation of Allah has been watching it happen. It's witness to this thing over and over again. It's almost as though when it sees our struggles, it says, here we go again. Here's another one. So in other words, time is a witness to the tragedy of human life. The tragedy of the human's aspira- human being's aspirations headed in the wrong direction. So time is being brought as a witness against us. Or a witness to the tragedy of the human being. Then finally, the word al-asr, just from, when we get into linguistic analysis, again, this will become more clear. We're still in the overview right now. And in the overview, one of the meanings of asr is time that is running out. Or the last ebb of time, the last portion of time. Even Salat al-Asr is the last part of the day. Right? When time is running out. And classically speaking, Asr was the time in ancient society, especially in Arab society, when the merchant and the traveler, they're always in a hurry. Because you know when it's nightfall, there's, gonna be, there's a lot of danger, and they can't protect their assets and things like that. So the most hustle and bustle happens when? At Asr time. That's the busiest, most urgent time. And by using that as an oath, you know there are other times of day that Allah uses for an oath also. He says, وَالصُبْحِ إِذَا أَسْفَرْ وَالْفَجْرِ وَلَيَالٍ عَشْرِ وَالضُحَى These are different times of the day. Allah uses different times of the day to swear by. Even وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى Right? The daytime. But specifically the use of asr is a time that is associated with a sense of urgency. In other words, the, the next lesson we're learning here in this surah as we go on is, Whatever Allah has to say, the time for you and me to react is not a lot of time. There's a state of emergency. We need to act quickly because the, the dawn of our life has set upon us. The sun, 
the, the, the sunset of our life is at bay. It's basically, it's around the corner. So we need to act now. It's this, this idea of time running out, the timer ticking away. That's being captured in just the words, Al-Asr. So the, this last uh, uh, benefit of this oath is a sense of urgency. And one, one alim, he compared, Mufti uh, Muhammad Shafi among others, compared the struggle of the human being that is depicted in Surah Al-Asr to the one who's trying to sell ice. In ancient, ancient times, they didn't have freezers and stuff like that, right? So the ice vendor, he doesn't have a lot of time. And it's melting away. And he has to make use of these sales and get the product out to the customer in a certain time. And if that time goes away, then all of that effort is gone to waste. All, so he's this, he has this sense of urgency to accomplish what he needs to accomplish. The other part of the overview, inshallah, we'll talk about more about the middle ayah later on. But about the last ayah, one thing for now, Commonly, it, the, the last ayah of Surah Al-Asr is understood as having four components. Of course, it's very easy to see that. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Number one, وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Number two, وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ Number three, and وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ Number four, four conditions. The first condition being those who believe, those who act righteously or do righteous deeds. The third being they enjoin to the best of their ability and to, to uh, counsel one another with truth and then also doing the same with perseverance. These are the four conditions that are mentioned. But one of the things we're going to learn today as part of the overview is that these four things are actually one, one thing. They seem like they are four things, but they are lazim wa malzum. They are necessarily connected to each other. They are actually inseparable. And actually, all of the rest is the fruit of the first. Iman. The first thing that's mentioned is Iman. And then there are three other things mentioned. But what we're gonna learn is, if one really has Iman, then the next three things are naturally bound to happen. They are bound to happen. And if those things don't happen, guess what's missing? Iman. So if one wants to check if they really have Iman or not, they can check by the minimal standard of Iman set by Surah Al-Asr, what are the consequences of Iman? What happens right after Iman? Amilu salihat, tawasi bil haq, tawasi bil sabr. If those things aren't happening, then there's something missing in Iman. And by the way, all of these four are connected in a profound way. Even if you take the second case, Amilu salihat. What is after wa Amilu salihat? They act righteously, they enjoin the truth. They don't keep the good to themselves. Now they're enjoying the truth. I'm using the, the cliche translation. The idea of it is to get the truth to others. Tell others to do good too. In other words, if you are truly doing good, it is impossible for you to keep it to yourself. It's impossible. A necessary consequence of that will be you will have to share it with others. That is part of goodness. And then when you do enjoy the truth to others, you will get people that respond to you, and you will get people who hate what you have to say. And when you get people who hate what you have to say, you will necessarily need to develop what? Sabr. You're gonna have to have it. It's a necessary, these are all connected things. The one leads to the other, to the other, to the other. And we'll explore more of that as we continue, inshaAllah ta'ala. This is actually why this surah opens up in most explicit detail these fruits of iman that usually in the Qur'an are mentioned in one or two terms. Sometimes Allah says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا That's enough. Because really the rest is what? Fruits of iman. Right? So if you understand iman properly, then the rest is understood. Sometimes He elaborates it a little more and says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ He'll say two things. But in this surah, He doesn't say two things, He says four things, and if you notice, the last two things, tawasi bil haqq and tawasi bil sabr, are actually deeds in and of themselves. They are deeds. And so, amilu salihat is a deed, amal. And tawasi bil haqq and tawasi bil sabr are also a'mal, amalain. They're both actions too. In other words, what we're learning here is, Allah highlighted the two actions. This is what I mentioned last time also. Allah is highlighting the two actions that get overlooked by people when they think about good deeds. The actions that they don't t- tend to think about when they think about doing good deeds are the ones that are explicitly highlighted so we understand this is the bare minimum of good deeds that you need to accomplish. That is tawasi bil haq and tawasi bil sabr included in the discussion. Now, I want to share with you um, a scenario. And I, I, I really benefited from this scenario as my teacher Dr. Abdul Sami' in one darsi explained it. I also heard Dr. Asar Ahmed talk about it in detail. Uh, very, very, I found it very beneficial. And we're going to look at the lessons of Surah Al-Asr before we get into the tafsir of the surah itself from an overview, even from the point of view of a non-Muslim. 
We'll look at some of the lessons and the logical co- cohesion of the surah from the point of view of, the non, of a non-Muslim. Whenever you are brought a problem, a dispute, some issue in life, any decent human being, what is the first thing they will do? The first thing they will do, no matter what dispute is brought to them, is they would, they would demand and they would make efforts to get to the facts of the case. The first thing is to get the facts right. To get to the truth itself. You wouldn't just take it at face value, you would explore it. And it's the more serious the problem, the more serious your inquiry into getting to the truth. You would, you would have to exhaust yourself in getting to the facts of the matter. Okay. This is the, the very least requirement of not a believer, but of decency. A decent human being, a decent judge, you know, they would have to, maybe, for example, there's a dispute in your family. You know, there's a couple of members of your family that are fighting and they brought the issue to you. At the, you know, indecently, what you would do is you don't like one of your cousins, you like the other one, so you pass judgment <laughs> against the one you don't like. But what does judgment or justice or decency require? That you look at the facts of the case. Okay. Now that you discover the truth, you actually, it's not enough that you found the truth, you have to now stand by that truth. You have to make a judgment, you have to take action in accordance with the truth that you found. It is possible that you find the truth, and when you find it, you don't like what you found. And when you don't like what you found, your actions do not, don't represent your findings. So what you believe to be true, isn't being reflected in your actions. What do we call that? Hypocrisy. That's nifaq, that's hypocrisy. But if you find something to be true, then it is part of human decency to stick to it, live by it, execute it, implement it, and that is the next necessary consequence. Now, that's one thing that you, you internalize it for yourself. That this is injustice and I'm not gonna do it. I've discovered that this is a wrong act, I will not commit it. I will discover that this is what I must do and I will do it. Now when you see other people doing wrong, then you know the, the society in which we live, we have the MYOB policy, mind your own business policy, right? This is not the policy of the prophets. This is not the policy of the believers. In other words, if the prophets were to mind their own business, then salah and dhikr of Allah would be it. That would be it. You have Suratul Muzammil, the messenger is being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا نِصْفَهُ أَوْ إِنْقُسْ مِنْهُ قَلِيلًا أَوْزِدْ عَلَيْهِ وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Recite the Qur'an. Remember Allah. That's for himself. But then there's another surah, right? There's Muzammil and what else? مُدَّثِرْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُدَّثِرْ قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ Go rise and warn. Warn who? Others. Tell them what you're doing is wrong. Now if you find something to be wrong, and when you see a wrong happening, it is human decency to say, that you should at least speak out against it. And say, you guys shouldn't do that. Now let me give you a, a, worldly, a real life scenario. You know that others people, other people's property should not be damaged. Right? People have the right that their property should be respected. You're walking down the street, and a couple of kids are playing baseball in the street, and they're hitting the ball really hard, and it's hitting other people's cars. Right? Now you know the truth already. The truth is they shouldn't be doing that. You wouldn't do that yourself. So you've done a good thing for yourself. You're not a criminal. Fine. But is that enough? Is that enough that you just walk by and you, the thought comes to your mind, maybe I should tell these guys this isn't a good thing. Maybe I should tell them they don't have a right to do that to other people. Maybe I should stand up for justice. But when you want to stand up for justice like that, you know some other thoughts come in your mind that stop you from doing that. What comes in your mind? And these guys might get together and beat me up. I might become the baseball. Right? Instead of bashing the car, they might bash me up. So I better keep my mouth shut if I know what's good for me. I, I know it, I, it's wrong, I shouldn't do it, but I don't have the guts to tell them not to do it. You understand? I know it's right, I must do it, I don't have the guts to tell somebody else, I don't know if you should do that or not. At, at the very least to tell them. If you can't enforce it, at least to tell them. Now the thing is, a decent human being, a courageous human being, doesn't just stop themselves from doing wrong, what else do they do? They open their mouth about it. And you know what? Even kuffar do that. Even non-Muslims do that. Even mushrikun do that. Even when they believe, they believe for some, 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 uh, some of them believe for example, that you know, animals have a right not to be eaten or whatever. They don't just become vegetarians. What else do they do? Animal rights protests. Right? They, they go out and they speak their mind. First they convince themselves of something. Then they implement it on themselves. And then what do they do? They go out there and stand up for it. They'll even take a beating for it, might get sprayed in the face for it. And this is not even Muslims. 
But this process exists for those who commit to something. Where does it all come from? It all started from their belief. Their belief was really strong and it was strong enough to change their behavior. It was strong enough to change their behavior then it was strong enough to make them speak out about it. And it was when they spoke out about it and they got tough times for it, they were willing to persevere. They were willing to just stick it out. No matter what, we're gonna do this thing. You know? So you have this, this idea of you know, uh, uh, this progression that starts with conviction. It doesn't just happen with Islam, it happens with any ideology by the way. Communists did this. You know, students in Tiananmen Square did this. The, the, the uh, Irani society did this when they revolted against the Shah. They did these, they, they believed something, they changed themselves, then they stood up for it and they, they spoke out about it, and when persecution came, they, they were patient persevered. This is the, you know, even among non-Muslim history, you find this is the revolution of Gandhi or whatever, right? Same idea. It is the same logical progression. But now we're taking this human, you know, and by the way, every time this kind of struggle happens, from a non-Muslim, we're not even talking from an Islamic point of view. From a non-Muslim point of view, those people who do this, who follow this process, are called heroes in history. They call them heroes in history. Whoever followed this procedure. This, you know, whether it's Martin Luther King, whether it's God, whoever it may be, they are looked upon as people who accomplish great things because they stuck to their beliefs and they stood up for justice no matter what the cost, right? And they are, their days are celebrated and their books written about them, monuments made about them. All of this is done because human beings deep down inside, no matter what culture, what tradition they come from, this is the process of decency that they respect. But then to imagine that you're fighting for something that in and of itself is incomplete. Most human beings, that they, even great human beings that struggled, whose struggles are commendable, they ended up struggling for something that in and of itself may be true, but it's only a small part of the truth. It's not the whole truth. And what Allah gave to us is the entire truth. So if they are willing to be convinced of something that is a small part of the truth, can you imagine a comparison between any of those activists and a believer? How much more convinced they, the believer should be? And if they are willing to change themselves, how much more willing should a believer be to change himself? And if they are willing to speak out about it, how much more willing should a believer be? And if they are willing to stand up against oppression, and still stick to their beliefs, and stand up for them, and speak the truth no matter what the cost, how much more of a right does Allah have on the believer? Sometimes the kuffar become an man, they can stand like that and compete. In sabr, this is why Allah says to us at the end of Surah Ali Imran, He says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, isbiru, wa sabiru, wa rabitu wa taqullah. Those of you who claim to believe, have perseverance, then compete in perseverance. Meaning your enemies also have sabr. They have beliefs, and they act out on those beliefs, and no matter how hard it gets, we must persevere, we must move forward. They have this idea, you should compete with them in sabr, and remain consistent. وَرَابِطُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ And you have something they don't have. Your taqwa will give you strength. They don't have taqwa, they will not give them strength. You will be able to beat them in this competition of sabr and perseverance. SubhanAllah. So, this, is, this was the overview that I wanted to share with you before we got into the tafsir of the surah itself. Now we begin with Allah Ta'ala. First we begin with the ayah, وَالْعَصَى We already talked about the oath and its benefits. So we'll look at some of the opinions of the Salaf, including the Sahaba. We begin with Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says it refers to the ages, meaning different uh, ages of different nations, and the decades and centuries that have passed in human existence. In other words, when we said, Allah is talking about all of human history as proof that human beings are in loss, even today, that's what Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu is saying in a nutshell. Ibn Kisan says al-asr refers to the night and the day. In other words, the human being should look at the nightfall and the daybreak and say, I am in loss. His, his, the state of emergency should be awakened every time the believer sees nightfall and every time he sees or she sees daybreak. Subhanallah. So we know it's easy to say, they said this and you move on. But when they said that, what is the consequence of that? What happens to our understanding of Qur'an and the way we look at the night and the day and the way we think about time? These are transformational things. You know, sometimes you find the salaf, they have, their tafsir is one word, two words. A whole ayah, their tafsir is one word. But if you think about that word, man, you realize how deep these people are, subhanAllah. They say a lot by saying a little. It takes us a lot more to say a little, but they say a little, but they end up saying a lot in, that, in those few words. They have these, this, this eloquence to them. Then, uh, similar, Hassan al-Basri says, this is from late day to sunset. 
This is the span from late I mean, begin, beginning of Asr all the way to sunset. Which is what I told you in ancient times, this was the time when there's a lot of hustle and bustle and emergency. Also it illustrates the end of an era. Meaning a day is like an era, it's the end of an era. So what that implies as far as the human being is concerned is, know that your life is basically on the verge of death. Know that you are on the verge, on the very edge of the end of your life. Just like the sun is about to run out and darkness is about to fall, this life of your world, your worldly life is about to run out, and the, not, the death of it is about to fall upon you. Think of it like that, and then you, you will develop that state of emergency. Qatada says it's the last part of the day, radiallahu anhu. Maqatil and Zamakhshari both actually commented, this is Salat al-Asr. Their interpretation of what Asr was, Salat al-Asr. And this is part of the the methodology of tafsir that says that when Allah swears by something, it must be something sacred. Right? That's one of the opinions about oaths. So in line with that methodology, they are saying, because Salat al-Asr is sacred, and how is it sacred? Allah calls it, you know, حَافِذُوا عَلَى صَلَوَاتِكُمْ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوَسْطَى Right? You know, guard your prayers, especially the middle prayer. And what's the middle prayer? Al-Asr. Right? So Al-Asr. That's, so Allah especially makes a point to talk about the Asr prayer, and why the Asr prayer? Again, tied to what society was doing at that time. They're, they're really, really busy at what time? Asr. That's when their meeting is. That's when the project is due. Then when the store is most busy. When the store is most busy, that's the hardest time to leave and make salah, isn't it? When the, project, when the meeting is going on, between exactly the times of... That's the, that's the time for them. When they have to break away from their dunya activities and go and make the salah. So Allah swears by that, and the fact that they're not able to do that, they are in loss. Subhanallah. Uh, then uh, in Abu Al Bayan, we find actually first we'll go to Aisha al-Tafasir. It says Adhru kulluhu. Al Asr refers to time, all of it. And when we get to uh, linguistic analysis, we'll see the difference between the word Dahr and the word Asr. In Surah Al-Insan, Allah says Ata ala al-Insani hinun min al-Dahri. So the word Dahr is used. Here the word Asr is used. So we'll understand the difference between these two words. But anyway, Aisha al-Tafasir says, Ad-Dahru kulluhu. Adwa al-Bayan says, Az-Zamanu kulluhu aw juz'un minhu. It is all time or a portion of time. And because of that portion of time, some of Fasirun even said, Al-Asr here is referring to the life of the Prophet wasallam, And they interpreted this because in another place in the Qur'an, Allah swears by the age of the Prophet. La umruka. He swears by the lifespan of the Prophet ﷺ. So they inferred from that that Allah says, وَالْعَصْرِ is referring to the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. In other words, the life of the last messenger that is being sent to all humanity, if they don't listen to him, they are definitely in loss. You see the connection? Because this is the dawn of, or this is the, pretty much the sunset of the life of this world. This is the last messenger. This is one of the greatest signs of the end of this world is the coming of the final messenger. And his life in and of itself is the biggest proof that human beings are headed for tremendous loss. So that's how they understood the word al-asr also. Then we'll look at az zujaj he says, وَرَبِّ uh, الْعَصْرِ That you know, this is actually a specific brand of a Mufassirun, they did this. Whenever Allah Azza wa swears by a creation, they assume that the word Rabb is mahdhuf, it's understood before it. So he's saying, I swear by the Master, the Lord of time. So when Allah says, وَالْفَجْرِ they, These scholars will interpret it as, وَرَبِّ الْفَجْرِ Right? وَالْضُحَى وَرَبِّ الْضُحَى That's how they'll understand it. And they've done this consistently. A brand of scholars have done that consistently. But that's not the majority position. Nonetheless, I feel inclined to share it with you because this is within Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and it did exist in our history. Anyhow, finally, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah says, الزَّمَانَ أَلَّذِي يَقَعُ فِيهِ حَرَكَاتْ بَنِي آدَمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ وَشَرٍ this is all time in which the activities of the human being, of the children of Adam have occurred, whether they be good activities or they be bad activities. And by, by saying good and bad, what he's actually telling us is that the human beings overall, what have they done more of, good or bad? They've done more bad, hence they are in khusr. Time has illustrated that they had opportunity to do both, but they ended up doing more bad than good, so human beings have ended up in loss. Now we're going to look at a linguistic analysis of the word Asr itself. The word Asr comes from a verb, uh, the fi'l form is Asarahu or I'tasarahu. Both are used, ifti'al and the thulathi mujarrad is also used. Literally means he pressed it, he squeezed it, he drenched it. It's used for cloth that is drenched in water, and then you squeeze it like that and all the water comes out. That's how it's used. Also it can be used for fruits. You know when you squeeze a fruit and you get juice out of it, Arabic word for juice is Asir. And the verbal form is اعتصره Or اعتصر البرتقال For example اعتصر التفاح 
In other, in other words, he drew juice out of the, the apple. He drew juice out of So to squeeze something, this is the first meaning. Asr uh, al-thawbah also, that to, he wrung water out of the garment. Then in the Qur'an we find, وَفِيهِ يَعْصِرُونَ This is the mudari' form that's also used in the Qur'an. This is the interpretation of the dream by Yusuf alayhi salam. And in it, you know, we find وَفِيهِ يَعْصِرُونَ And they also, they, they will squeeze juice, you know, how they, in the ancient times they used to press grapes. Uh, stomp on grapes to make wine or olives and other things like that that's the word being used for squishing them to, to actually bring the wine out of them or the juices out of them the poet says لَوْ كَانَ فِي أَمْلَاكِنَا أَحَدٌ يَعْصِرُ فِينَا كَالَّذِي تَعْصِرُ had there only been among our leaders any one of them that spends or, or, or squeezes out from his wealth to give to us the way you give in other words this, this guy from one tribe he goes to the leader of another tribe and he's trying to get some money out of him, right? So, and he thinks of money as, you know, you have so much, so what you give is just a little drop of droplets that you squished out of there. You have the core of it. So he says, I wish we had leaders that, you know, squished some of their wealth so we could enjoy the droplets the way you give. So he's trying to butter him up so he gives him some money, basically. That's what poetry is about. But you know, the benefit of poetry is it gives us an insight on how the Arabs use these words. So we have a better understanding of how Allah Azza wa Jalla is communicating with those ancient Arabs. Because it's their language, that's the, that's the language they spoke. Then we find Asarat, interesting usage of verbs in, the Quran, in, in ancient Arabic. Asarat is used for a woman who has reached the dawn of her, of her youth. In other words, her youth is about to expire. Then they say about her, Asarat, the feminine form is used for her. Or if a girl reaches you know, maturity, they also use the word Asarat, that she's matured into a woman. We find Asarat is Sahaibu, the clouds reached a point where they were to be squeezed by the winds. Literally the image the Arab would, it's very picturesque language, the clouds are imagined as like cloth that are squeezed and then the rain comes down. This is actually the imagery captured in the word in the Qur'an, وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُعْصِرَاتِ Same root, وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُعْصِرَاتِ مَاءً فَجَّاجَ Same root is used. The, 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 we set down from the clouds that are squeezed, meaning winds push them against each other and they get squeezed and then the rain comes down. That's the imagery that's been presented in these ayat. Then the Asr, is, uh, this is something we mentioned before, but I'll tell you where it comes from now. As Shihab writes this in uh, Sharh al Shafi, he says, it's, Asr is a period of time that, uh, a period of time in, during which someone you know passes away. And is also a period of time that you know in history where a nation became extinct, or a nation came to its end, which is tied to what we were saying in the beginning a state of emergency and also the tragedy of human history. That's the two themes that are connected in the meaning of uh, Asr. Then finally, a couple more, مَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَصْرًا it, You know, when you say مَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَصْرًا it means I didn't do it at the time I was supposed to do it. So Asr is used as a time you are supposed to do something. By understanding that implication of Asr, what we're learning in وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ is human beings are in loss and the time to change the way they are supposed to do it is right now. This is the time to change immediately. That's one of the benefits of Asr in that word. Then جَاءُوا وَلَكِنْ لَمْ يَجِئَ لِعَصْرِ Similar meaning. He came but not at the time he was supposed to come. Or they came but not at the time that they were supposed to come. This, these are the meanings of just the word Asr. We are being asked to reflect on time that is dripping away from all of us. We can get lost in the technicalities and the grammatical analysis and the quotes of the Mufassirun, but let's think about how this applies to us. You and I have 24 hours in a day. How many of them are gone in sleep? How many of them are gone in work? How many of them are put into efforts for, to build our savings, dunya savings, pay the bills, but how much of it is being prepared for, so we can pay our bills in the akhirah? How much of it is going so that we can actually be ready to stand before Allah Azza wa Jal for that audit? There's the audit in tax season, then there's the ultimate audit that's coming in which we all have to stand for every single thing that we've done. These, you know, if I, I say this all the time. One of the benefits of this surah and using the word asr, because it's part of a day, is Allah is making us imagine our entire life as though it is how many? One day. That it's one day. If you can transform how you spend one day, basically you have transformed your life. Because you know, you know this already, many of you work full time or are students full time or you know, do you take care of the home full time? A lot of your days are exactly the same. There's a lot of routine. It's the same exact thing over and over and over again. So if you can bring a change to one part of your day, you've actually transformed one part of your entire life. 
You've transformed an entire part of your life. And that the time to make that change is running out. And my personal advice to you, this is not part of tafsir, just personal advice, we make changes to ourselves in Ramadan. We make those changes. We make changes for Eid. We make changes, or we, you know, break from our schedule on special occasions, at the death of a family member. You know, we make changes on the, the, these kinds of special occasions, at the birth of a child, etc., etc. But then we go back to the routine. We go back to our old ways. Why do we go back to our old ways? Because we don't see the sense of urgency. You see, you don't say, man, I used to go to work at, on time at 9 o'clock. And I was doing that for a while, but then I just, you know, I got lazy and you know, now I go at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. You won't do that because you know you're going to get fired. You know there's a sense of urgency, you have to be there. And the fact that you have convinced yourself that there's an absolute sense of urgency, you have no choice but to be there on time every day, you have no choice in the matter, it automatically made your consistency easy for you. It didn't make it hard anymore. You just have to do it, you don't think twice about it. Somebody says to you, how do you do it man? I just gotta do it. I don't think about it, I just do it. That's it. Now if we really, really believed, like we believe we will lose our job when we don't show up on time, right? If we really, really believed that we are heading for loss, and there are certain behaviors that need to enter into our life, like the regularity of salah, for example, like the abandonment of vain activity, for example, if we were really convinced that not changing our behavior will lead us to loss, like the loss of a job, right? Like, you know, nobody's gonna be late for their immigration appointment. They're gonna be there two hours early. Right? They're gonna prepare the night, they have Qiyam al-Layl the night before, because it's at 6 a.m., so they won't go to sleep. They'll be there early. Because they are convinced this has to do with, if they don't do this, they will be in loss. If we are truly convinced this will lead to loss, then changing one day, rather changing your whole life becomes very easy. But when does it become easy? When there is belief. Which is why when Allah talked about khusr, what's the first exception He mentioned? Those who what? They believe. It is not just casually, oh, those who believe, yeah, I'm included. No, no, no. This is not the kind of belief we're talking about here. This is real deep conviction that what I am doing is directly connected to my success, directly connected to my failure. I better change my ways. I better get my act together. This is, this is just in the word al-asr itself. Just in the word, how it's being squeezed and drenched away. And I don't have time. The students, those of you that are students here, you have an assignment due. And you forgot to do it. There's time running out. Right? The kind of urgency you will see in a student. The kind of urgency to study for the exam before the final. The kind of urgency you will see for an accountant in tax season. The kind of urgency you will see, for example, if you're late to work. The kind of behavior you will have at home. Things will be upside down. You better not be late. You're gonna turn the whole house up. Nothing matters at that time. You won't care about breakfast or this or that or the other. You will go. Because there's a sense of urgency. You are convinced you will be in trouble if you don't do it. You're absolutely convinced. We have to compare that conviction to our conviction in, in terms of our deen. And our conviction, you know, if your boss says to you, I swear to you, you are in trouble. If your boss says that to you, he says, I swear, he comes into the office, he doesn't point at you, he says, every single employee is in trouble. I swear. Every single one. They're gonna, they're gonna lose big. When he walks away, do you think any of the employees are ah, not me, <laughs> I'm okay. Nope. He didn't specify, right? He didn't say some people are in trouble. He didn't say that guy over there is in trouble. What did he say? Every single one. You're all in trouble. And you're gonna find out pretty soon, time's running out. There's a deadline. You're, you're gonna find out very, very soon who, you know, how much trouble you're really in. Now when you hear that, in dunya, there's a sense of urgency. There's, oh my God, what am, I, what am I supposed to do? What does he want? Why is he angry? What, what, is it something we're not doing? Now think about this. When you get a job, and I'm giving you these examples so we understand the rest of the surah well, inshaAllah ta'ala. This is a critical surah for the life of a Muslim. It is such a gift from Allah that He gave us three ayat that could change our life. You don't have to memorize Qur'an to change your life. Just remember Surah Al-Asr, man, subhanAllah, how it will transform your life. How it will transform your life. Now, now think about this. You get a job. Your boss says to you, you got four tasks. Every day, you have how many? Four tasks. Sometimes your boss gives you tasks that you're really good at. And sometimes you have tasks that you don't like doing. 
But because this is your job, how many tasks do you have to do? All four. You only like two of them, but you still have to do four. Two of them you enjoy doing, two of them you don't enjoy doing, but you still do four. Now if some of, the, some of you decide, or I decide, I'm just gonna do two of those. Because I, I'm really good at those two. I'm not gonna even touch the other two, I'm not worried about that. He'll be okay. When he sees how impressive my first two are, he'll forget about the other two. So you don't do your other two tasks. And the boss comes after a week, so what's, uh, what's the story? Where, where are you on the progress? I finished the first two 100%. Oh, what about the other two? Actually, I, um, I'm not gonna do those. But see how good I did the first two. What's gonna happen to this person? What do you think is gonna happen? He's gonna keep his job? No. Even if you did not, a, not the best job, but at least you did your best to, for all four. You didn't get 100%. You got a 70% for all four. That's better than you getting 100% for one of them. You understand? So when Allah sets out four conditions, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ And we say, Iman, yeah, we should work on our Iman. Some good deeds. And you say, ah, this other stuff, this is for speakers. This is for da'i, this is for the shaykh, this is for somebody, this is not for me. This is for somebody else. Then what are you doing? You're saying, Allah says, those, everyone's in trouble except people who meet four conditions, but you're only interested in two, or one, or three, or whatever. You're picking and choosing, that is also in loss. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. That's the attitude we have to develop in regards to this surah. I'll take 10 more minutes inshallah ta'ala, we'll probably have to have a third session about surah al-asr. Inshallah. That was my, my fear originally was three sessions on surah al-asr. Wallillahi alhamd. Okay. Let's get to inna al-insana lafi khusr. First of all, the word inna. Inna is used in the Arabic language, uh, not just to mean certainly, but to talk to a group of people that are in doubt about what you are saying. By using the word inna in inna al-insana lafi khusr, we are already learning that most human beings, when they hear this, guess what? They don't believe it. They don't believe it's that, it's that bad. It can't be that bad, bro. That's a pretty depressing lecture you gave. <laughs> It can't be that bad. And Allah is making sure you understand, for sure this is the case. Inna. Rhetorically, it's used, izalat al shak. It is used to remove doubt. And by saying that, I say the doubt already exists. The doubt already exists. And you would think this is talking to al kafir. Some mufassirun said, al insan ay al kafir. But then other mufassirun came with even stronger dalil against that. Why? Because al-istithna at the end, illa, with the exception. Because Allah put exception, it's all humanity. If it was al-kafir, then there wouldn't be an exception to the kafir. Kafir is kafir. But because it's illa at the end, this is referring to each and every single human being. Now let's talk about the word insan quickly. The word insan, we've talked about this before because it's come up many times in different surahs. The word insan comes from different roots, it's argued. One of them is nisyan, forgetfulness. And part of that is the human being can be reminded that he's in really, really deep trouble, but what happens soon after? He forgets. You hear a khutbah, you get reminded, you remember, and you say, man, seriously, I gotta get my act together. And then you, by the time you get to the car in the parking lot of the masjid, you've already forgotten. Insan. Human beings, Allah gave him a covenant before he even came to this earth. Alastu bi rabbikum, qalu bala shahidna in surah al araf. He said, Am I not your master? We said, Yes, of course you are. We bear witness. We bear witness to Allah that He's our master when we came to this earth. Guess what happened? We forgot. We forgot. We forget the seriousness of saying La ilaha illallah. We forget the power of saying Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We forget. So the word insan, as opposed to al-fard, the individual, al-nafs, the person. There are different words that are alternatives. Al-bashar, the, the you know, people, al-nas. But al-insan here, two benefits of it. One, to allude to our forgetfulness. And two, the word insan is individual, it's called ism lil-jins. The benefit of knowing that is, this word includes two things. It includes all categories, meaning all human beings, and at the same time it's singular. And here we have to learn something, this is the last thing we'll share for today inshaAllah ta'ala, just a little bit about the word insan, is the concept of the diffusion of responsibility. This is a concept in psychology, it's called diffusion of responsibility. All of you are here, uh, let, let me give you a classroom example or a home example. 
My kids are at home. I have five kids, alhamdulillah. They're, they're home, they're running around. As I'm leaving the, the house, I say to them, be good, and I close the door. I just say, be good. Are they gonna be good? No. This is what you call diffusion of responsibility. But if I open the door and I say, Husna, don't bother your sister. Waliya, don't draw on the wall. Huda, don't yell. Imad, go to sleep. If I specify, then are they gonna be more responsible? Yes. If I say generally, then what happens? It must be talking about someone else, I'm already good. You understand? The teacher says, in the classroom, the, the kids are making lots of noise. The teacher says, be quiet everyone. Does it work? But the teacher takes one student and makes an example out of them. Everybody's making noise. This is, by the way, for teachers, this is a good tip. Okay. Everybody's making noise, you single out one student. Kareem, you want to keep talking? Just one. Guess what's gonna happen to everybody else? Everybody chills out. Why? When you specify, there's no more diffusion of responsibility. It, it didn't get di you know, divided up. And a lot of times when people are given a responsibility, they start assuming, yeah, it's important, but there's always someone else who can do it. Right? Yeah, there's trouble. You know, the, t the teacher walks in, you know, you guys are in big trouble. But the teacher says, you guys are in big trouble. Not that scary. I pick on Kareem again, Kareem, you don't know how much trouble you're in. Is that far more scarier for Kareem? It is, isn't it? Now to say, إِنَّ النَّاسَ لَفِي خُسْرَ People are in trouble, people are in loss, that's one thing. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ Each and every single individual forgetful human being is immersed in a state of loss. So when the human being hears this ayah, who is he to think about? Himself, forget everybody else. Forget, forget everybody else. It's just, I am in trouble. I shouldn't think about anybody else right now. I should only be thinking about myself. When it comes to our salvation, being saved on the day of judgment, there is no charity. On that day, the mother doesn't care about the child. The mother doesn't care about the child. With the exception of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the people, the, the prophets alayhi wa sallam are saying, we can't make shifa for you. Shifa for you. Go someone else. I have no, nothing to give you. That is the day when brother is running from brother. Best friends are no longer best friends. وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ On that day, you love your family so much. And by the way, we sometimes out of love of people, we do really bad things. Right? We do really, really bad things. And those same people, the, the person who's about to be thrown in hellfire on the Day of Judgment, he says, وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ He says to Allah Azza wa Jal, لَوْ يَفْتَدِي بِعَذَابِ عذاب يَوْمِئِذِمْ بِبَنِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَأَخِي Can I be saved from the punishment in exchange for my son? Can you throw my son, my baby? Can you throw him in hell instead of me? That's what the guy will say. And my wife. And my brother. And my mother, wa ummi, wa abihi, wa fasilati, and his extended family. Wa man fil ardi jamiyan. He will look at all humanity and say, Oh Allah, you're about to throw me. Why don't you take all of them instead? All of them. Just let me let me be saved. Thumma yunjihi, then he should be saved. Subhanallah. That is the state of affairs. Now think about that. Uh, this day, on that day, you will forget everyone. So what we're what learning here is this is the time to forget everyone first. You should be concerned about them. Second, who should you be concerned about first? Yourself. I say this with all sincerity and goodwill at heart to the parents of Muslim children. We are so worried about our children, we're not too worried about ourselves. Ah, oh, my kids gotta go to an Islamic school. We gotta make sure that they're in a good environment. What about your good environment? Why are you watching that stuff? Why are you talking like that? Why are you cheating in business? Why aren't you getting up for salah? We remember those we love? And we forget who our own selves, subhanAllah. Can you talk to this? Can you talk to that? You know, they'll come to the shaykh, the imam. Can you talk to my, my kids? They need some advice. You don't need advice? Really? Because I will think if you messed up in raising your kid, the first person who needs advice is you. What happened all these years? Where have you been? Where's the, where's the parent been who's supposed to do his job? SubhanAllah. So, inna al-insan, bringing responsibility to ourselves, the state of emergency, the fact that we are not safe, from loss. We're not even discussing loss yet. That's later on in the ayah. We're just at Ibn al-Insan. And I think this is, it suffice to conclude here inshaAllah ta'ala as far as today's dars. And bi next Tuesday we'll try and wrap up
درس صلاة العصر. But in the insan la fi khus. No doubt, each and every single human being, as forgetful as they are, are deeply immersed in loss. And as they realize that, they should also realize that Allah has already sworn time is running out. Time for them to change their behavior is running out. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us internalize the lessons from Surah Al-Asr. May Allah Azza wa Jal embed these lessons onto our hearts that we may constantly remember them. May Allah make us like the Sahaba who whenever they met each other, they wouldn't part each other. لم يتفرق حتى يقرأ You know, they, they wouldn't res- leave each other's company until they would recite to each other, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين إن شاء الله تعالى to see all of you uh, next Tuesday والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته